indexes, and they're hot right now, showing up in a lot of places. For example, Facebook um, has introduced graph search. I don't know if you're familiar with the feature, but they're rolling it out to all users. So a billion people will basically have a feature that's called graph search, and that's, that's very interesting. There are also O'Reilly books uh, written about graph databases, um, and it, it's really all over today. Of course, the, the big web companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, they realized that there's value in graph technology early on. So they, they built their own technology right back in 2004 and, and earlier. There was no off-the-shelf technology for, for uh, handling and querying graphs. And, and these companies um, are now very successful because they leverage the graphs in their industry. And we'll talk more about that later as well. Let's take a look at web search, for example. Pre-Google, uh, you would, if you wanted to find a website, you would go to some kind of inferior search engine, one of the, the, the many small ones that were around, or you would go to some kind of index page, or you would look in a magazine, perhaps, uh, to find links and so on. Um, and uh, that just wasn't very effective. Along came Google and realized that, hey, there's actually value in mapping out and storing how these websites refer to each other. And, and it's a graph, right? So they, they invented PageRank, um, and it's actually named after Page, uh, one of the, Larry Page, one of the, the creators, right? So um, and this, this has held up surprisingly well as a, as a search algorithm, right, uh, for, for quite, a, quite a long time. I'm just going to see we have a question here. Let's see, make sure all the technology is working out. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, David. Got it. Okay, perfect. Just got a question. Someone couldn't hear it, but probably uh, need to turn on your speakers. All right, we'll continue. But And, and this uh, search technology has held up surprisingly well. It's all built on graphs, of course. Uh, and then in 2012, last year, uh, Google introduced the knowledge graph, which takes search to a whole new different level in terms of being able to search, um, I suppose, both semantically um, as, as well as just um, it, it, it through index data. So if, if you haven't seen the Google Knowledge Graph, you can search for, uh, for example, an actor or a movie or, or a company. And uh, alongside the search results, you also get some information about it, right? So you'll get this movie had these actors, this director, and so on. You can click on those and continue to explore that Knowledge Graph. Um, Facebook, of course, introduced graph search, which allows you to search your social graph. We'll take a, a look at an example later. The same is happening in, for example, job search. It's happening in many industries, but job search is another where you would perhaps input, I want to find a job in this location within this kind of category, and maybe you type in some keywords and you search. Um, and that's changed very much uh, in, in the past few years as well. So we work with uh, some of the biggest companies in this space, for example, Glassdoor, one of the leading job search prov providers um, in the US. And uh, we, sorry, there was a question here. I'll skip that. So uh, we uh, work with them to help power their, um, their uh, social features. And, and we'll take a look at that use case as well. But, but the common theme here is that these companies are realizing that there's a lot of value in leveraging the social graphs and the, uh, the, the, the company graphs and, and the various other graphs that exist in their industries. Sorry there. Oops. The admin display here is, okay, we'll continue. Sorry about that. So let's take a look at some other industries where Neo4j is being used. One strong one for us is content management and access control, where you can store how users have access to certain assets. And they might not have just direct access. They might have access through a complex set of roles. And this is very easy to map out and store as a graph. And you can, of course, query it instantly. Another one is insurance risk analysis, looking at how different uh, insurance assets uh, fit together in larger packages that can be sold and priced and so on. 
Geo is a big use case for us as well. Um, and uh, we work with a, a variety of companies in the geo space. But a, as you might imagine, finding the path from one location to another is very much a graph problem. Network cell analysis is another interesting one, being able to map out um, signal strengths in different locations to certain radio towers and optimize that in ways so that you can perhaps um, plan where you want a new radio tower and so on, optimize coverage. Network asset management is a really strong one for us as well, as you might imagine. Uh, you can pretty much one-to-one -one map a computer network uh, to a graph. And uh, bioinformatics, obviously, uh, proteins, how they fit together, um, how drugs interact, and so on. Web browsing, storing um, how a, a certain visitor perhaps visited a website, through which pages did they go, and then querying that for some, some interesting uh, business insight. Portfolio analytics into across really various industries, but in finance, you can do portfolio analytics um, to, um, to see, for example, hedged bets, these kinds of things. Gene sequencing, so what life sciences is a, certainly an upcoming area in, in the world of graphs, uh, where you can store various uh, data and metadata as, as graphs and, and represent quite things quite nicely. And perhaps one of the biggest spaces is mobile social, where where um, the the big um, consumer web players uh, have dominated the space for for quite a while, but there are also a lot of of smaller companies uh, that uh, that are having great success there with graphs today. So th the theme here is I want you guys throughout the presentation to think about what are the key graphs in your industry uh, and, and start to think about that. To help you think about that, uh, Gartner uh, a while back put out a piece where they talked about the five graphs of the consumer web and the consumer web being the four big web giants, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. And uh, they have basically been successful because they have identified the five graphs that are relevant in their space. And those five graphs are the interest graph, the intent graph, the payment graph, the mobile graph, and the social graph. They have identified those graphs and they have leveraged the data in those graphs to their advantage. On a similar note, we can look at the five graphs of telecommunications, where you have the network graph, uh, network dependency management, and so on. You have a social graph in telco as well. Social is, is quite a broad theme that spans across lots of industries. You have a call graph. Uh, master data is, is very important in telco, storing that. Um, and Telco also have quite a challenge with help desks, as we'll take a look at later. There are also five graphs in finance, the payment graph, the customer graph, the entitlement graph, the asset graph, and the master data graph again. Of course, finance needs to store a lot of, of, of important master data, so that's a key use case. Um, but, but there are many other use cases as well, and we'll take a look at those. Finally, we'll also take a look at the healthcare industry. Uh, there's the provider graph, the patient graph, how, how people fit together, uh, how people communicate with each other, right? Um, the bioinformatics graph, the master data graph again, um, and, and the treatment graph. And obviously, all of this that we've talked about up until now, all these use cases are built on Neo4j. Neo4j is the, the leading graph database today in the world, and we have more than half a million downloads. Um, we're uh, an open source product, so we have an amazing community ecosystem. And uh, we've been in, in development for about 13 years, um, in production for 10 years, um, and we have over 30 of the global 2,000 uh, companies um, as customers, and that's quite remarkable for this technology, and, and it does speak to, um, to its, uh, its versatility and, uh, and use. So let's look at our uh, early adopter segment first. 
back in the day, a couple of years ago, we formulated what we expected to happen, we, where we thought that graphs would uh, be applicable and where graph, graphs would dominate. And this was a, a small matrix across um, four use cases in three industries. And if we take a look at what this looks like today, this is a selection of commercial customers. It doesn't include uh, our community users. We have um, hundreds of thousands of community users that use Neo4j. But this is a selection of commercial customers. And uh, you can see that uh, there are quite a number of logos that you probably recognize here. Uh, in, in network and data center management, we work with some of the giants, right? Uh, NetApp, Serena, you probably know of, um, HP, Cisco, uh, and, and many others. This, in the social space, uh, we've tried to cram as many logos in there as possible. There, there are certainly more, um, but, but some of the big players like Glassdoor and eHarmony are, are, are working with our product. Right? But this is probably not the most interesting part. The most interesting part is that the market proved this a little bit wrong, and the matrix today actually looks more like this. And this is still incomplete. We lost you, uh, David. David, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I went on mute for some <coughs> reason. Okay. Oh. What, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, you're talking about uh, this slide, actually. The biggest okay. slide. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll just skip there. I, I was basically just saying, uh, please keep in mind um, that Neo4j is used across this wide range of use cases and industries where when, when you think about uh, your own graphs, right? So uh, you, graphs may be leveraged where you least expect it, basically. Um, and, uh, and the market really surprised us with, with where people used graphs beyond our, our initial matrix. So we've talked about graphs for a while now, and if you're not familiar with what a graph is, let's just make sure we, we cover that ground. Uh, hopefully you have some idea, but let's, let's cover that. So a graph is a data structure that represents nodes and relationships between those nodes. All the relationships have a direction, and they have a, a single type. And you can basically traverse the graph or look for patterns in the graph um, with Neo4j, and it's done lightning fast, right? Um, nodes and relationships can also store property data, so you can say in this case you have a node on the left uh, whose name is James, he has a certain age, and so on. Uh, he loves Mary, he lives with Mary, and so on. Um, and you can see uh, another very interesting aspect of graphs is that you can mix the kinds of data that you store. So currently we're storing data about a person, um, data about his spouse, um, and data about his car, and who drives it, and who owns that car, and that's all represented in this graph. There's no table underneath, so this is, this is the data model. This is it. And of course, a graph is a graph is a graph, so right now we're talking about people. Uh, we could also be talking about um, cell phone data, right, where, where a, a particular phone authorizes with a particular base station that uh, is related to a, a certain office and so on. A very powerful property of graphs is what we call whiteboard friendliness. And if you see this picture, this is a, a common scene from, from when we work with customers. We have a whiteboard where we draw the graph that they, that they want to store. So we don't draw uh, any, any uh, class diagrams or anything like that. We draw the actual data that they want to store. A person has this and so on and so on. And that is exactly what their data will look like in the graph. So there is no activity of, okay, let's figure out the schema for this, right? The, what you draw on the whiteboard is what you store in the database.
it's, and it's incredibly powerful. And, and, it, and it's very um, liberating when you start working that way. So for, for, uh, for anyone coming from SQL land, uh, we could do an analogy here uh, where you might be storing info about customers and their bank accounts. So we have Alice, and Alice has three accounts. And what we do is we put a join table in the middle uh, that joins these up, right? So one person can have many accounts, and uh, two people or two or more people can share the same account, right? It can be a joint account. So we put a join table in the middle. And the way this is represented in a graph is that those become nodes, the records become nodes, and the, the join table records become the relationships. And that is effectively the equivalent graph that we looked at. So here's a question. What can we do with graphs, right? So I mentioned previously uh, an example with uh, Facebook graph search. So let's take a look. Let's say I search for sushi restaurants in New York that my friends like. Right, so then it would look for my friends. It would look for the restaurants that they like, the restaurants that serve sushi and that are in New York, right? And, and that's a graph pattern, and we can ask the database to give us all instances of that pattern. And the way we do that in Neo4j is we use Cypher, which is the query language. And the, this particular query would look like this. Don't be scared. It's, it's, if, it, if it looks unfamiliar, but it, it, it's quite similar to SQL. If you come from SQL, it should be a little bit similar. So we have the key, the, key, the key of the query is the match clause, which looks for a pattern in the graph. And here we're saying we want to match the pattern where I have a friend. The friend likes a restaurant. The restaurant is in a certain city, and the restaurant serves a certain cuisine. And that's the pattern we want to look for. You also tell the database that my name is David, the city's location is New York, and the cuisine we're looking for is sushi. And we're, we're basically instructing Neo4j to find all instances of this pattern in the graph. And it brings back to us those, and then we ask for the restaurant name for each one. Right? So this is quite similar to a SQL select statement. And what this actually does is when we fire it off it real, in real time, it traverses the graph and finds all these patterns immediately. Of course, like we talked about before, a graph is a graph is a graph. So in this case, it's sushi we're looking for. In a different case, it might be what drugs will bind to a certain protein while at the same time not interacting with a certain drug. Right? So that could be a bioinformatics use case or many other use cases that we, that we also took a look at, right? So one common theme that we work a lot with is moving processes that are originally offline or batch to being real-time for connected data specifically. And uh, we'll, we'll look at a couple of those use cases as well, um, but, but it's, it's quite a common theme. Uh, people using, for example, a SQL database doing pre free computations or offline batch computations uh, in order to answer specific queries about their data. Uh, and they don't have to do that. When they realize that they can ask the questions immediately from the graph without pre-computing anything, then uh, that's also very liberating. So let's just look a little bit more at querying graphs so you're familiar with the concept. The query language is called Cypher. And it's based around graph patterns. So in this case, we're looking for a pattern where some a, node A loves a certain node B. Right? That's a small pattern that we can look for. And the way we do that is we describe that with a match clause. So we say match A loves B. And this is the actual syntax uh, of the query language. If we have a specific person A that we're looking for um, or that we know of, then we can constrain the query. Right? We can say where A's name is a, um, and this will look, basically find uh, all lovers of A, right? Quite straightforward, and if you know SQL, this should, should look fairly familiar. So here, here's a, a, a more complex query. Uh, this, this query starts out with um, a boss whose name is John, John Doe. So we're constraining the query to say only uh, where the boss's name is John Doe, and we're saying the boss manages 
what we call a sub here. So boss, sub, and report here, they're all sub variable names essentially within the query, just local variables so we can later on refer to those nodes within the same query, right? So we want to find the boss manages a sub zero to three levels down, and then the sub in turn manages a person one to three levels down. So this can potentially be uh, a company organization that goes six levels down, right? Which can be quite a lot of people if you look at a large organization like Cisco, for instance. And what we want to return is for each sub, we want to return the number of reports that they have. So given a boss, we want to find the people that report to the boss three levels down. And for each such person, we want to find how many people three levels down from them report to them. It's, it's a, kind of a complex query, right? But it's, it's very neatly expressed in Cypher. Now the equivalent in SQL would be something like this something like this. And uh, I, I would bet that if you, if I gave you, let's say, half an hour to look at this query, you probably wouldn't be sure what it did, right? Whereas if I gave you this, you would probably, given that you knew Cypher, obviously, you would probably know what it did within um, half a minute or a minute. And on top of that, imagine the requirements changing, right? So here's the SQL query. Now imagine my saying, OK, we also want each report. Um, we, we only want to look at the direct reports that work in a certain department um, where the department's revenue is greater than this for this specific year. And uh, if you work in SQL land, your head probably blows up at that point. Whereas if you work in Cypher land, you can simply augment your pattern to include that part. So let's look at a concrete example in network management. We'll start out by creating a very small data set. So this is a create statement in Cypher. You can think of it as an, as an insert uh, in SQL. And we're basically creating a small graph that you'll see on the, the right-hand side here, where a website depends on a database VM and a web server VM, which depend on server 1 and 2, which depend on the SAN, right, and so on. So now let's ask the first question. If server one goes down, what is affected? And we can ask that by, by sending this query, where we ask match any upstream that transitively all the way down, many hops potentially, depends on this server S, whose name is server one, and return all upstreams to us. And this query will go off in the graph, find server one, and walk all these depends on up relationships upstream, right? and return to us all, uh, all, all pieces of equipment or services that depend on S. And in this case, it's the web server VM and the public website eventually somehow depend on server one. We can look at dependencies down as well. So we can say um, W depends on many hops down on a downstream, where W name is public website, return downstream. Right? And this will find the public website for us and it will find all the downstream dependencies of the website. And in this particular case, we see that there are five distinct um, downstream dependencies. Finally, a, a query here finds the most dependent on component, right? So we find a pattern where a component has a number of dependencies, right? Uh, or, or dependents, rather. So dependent depends a number of levels down on a certain component. I'm not constraining this query. So if you look at the previous one, they have a where clause specifying that, it, uh, that we're looking at a specific service whose name is public website. In this case, we're not doing that. And just like the SQL query, if you don't constrain it with a where clause, right, it's going to look at look through all the data trying to find what you're looking for. And in this case, we'll find all, all the instances of this pattern. And this is a little bit of more of a complex query, but it quite, um, quite succinctly expresses uh, the, the aggregation operation of finding who's most dependent upon, right? So the count function here uh, is an aggregation that performs an implicit group by on the other fields, so that would be uh, C in this case. So for each C, we return the distinct number of dependents, uh, basically other services upstream that depend on that C. So we do that for each C. And then we order it by that count and we limit it by one, 
which will basically give us the top result. And in this case, we can see that the SAN is actually the service that has the most number of dependents in this network. And that's, that's quite an interesting statistic you can get with just four lines of Cypher. So let's take a look at two network management use cases before moving on. This is a uh, French telecommunications company, and they had a challenge where they had uh, many legacy systems, uh, I believe over 30 legacy systems, that stored some kind of information about their network, right? Um, so you would have one legacy system that may have known a little bit about this particular uh, WiMAX network in southern France and so on and so on. What they did was they took the information from all those systems and aggregated it together into one Neo4j graph database cluster. Right? And, and what this enables them to do is they have, if you will, a single source of truth for their entire network. So they can ask, for example, if they were going to do a service window on a particular piece of equipment, they can immediately ask what services depend on this particular piece of equipment. And that's quite powerful, actually, for being able to ask, ask that across your entire, um, your entire uh, uh, carrier network. So they, they very much enjoyed the experience with Neo4j, uh, especially the one-to-one the -one mapping between what your data is and what the database actually stores, right? There's no thinking about, okay, what, what tables do we need, what, what uh, columns do we need for this, uh, what if we need to add on an extra column, and so on and so on. Right? It, it's, it's a very flexible data model where what you draw or what you model is really what the database also stores. Another interesting one is HP, where uh, they have a product that's called the Unified Correlation Analyzer. And uh, it, it's basically a product that allows you to hook it up to your, your carrier grade network. And uh, if a certain piece of equipment dies, uh, that piece of equipment may not send an alert, right? But hopefully pieces of equipment around that one, around the failed one, will start to send alerts. And eventually maybe one of them fails and things around those start to send alerts, right? And you see the picture here and what the Unified Correlation Analyzer allows you to do is um, it collects all these alerts and by, by having all of the network information, the entire topology stored in Neo4j, it can easily find out, okay, these things are sending alerts uh, at, at, at these time frames. Uh, it's probably this piece of equipment that's broken and they can recommend that, right? Which is quite an interesting and powerful feature um, in, in larger carrier grade networks. So let's talk a little bit about performance. If we look at a, a, a very small graph where you might only have thousands of nodes and you only want to ask questions that go one degree out, let's say, right? So you have a thousand nodes and you only want to get the neighboring node of, 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 of any given node at any time. Then you're probably fine in a relational database, right? Even though your experience would be much better in Neo, um, you're, you're, you're probably fine performance-wise in a relational database. As you start adding on data into a relational database, your performance will get worse, much worse. And we have several customers that have experienced this Starting out with a relational database, it works great. Uh, then you double your data size and your performance plummets. And uh, it's quite common. Size is, of course, just one factor here. There's another factor, which is how far out do you query? Even if you have a small graph, if you want to ask, how does person A know person B across an arbitrary number of hops, your relational database will still struggle on a small data set with that. So if you have a large graph, if you want to ask questions that go more than one hop or rather more than two hops out, uh, you, you're much better off with a graph database. And uh, we have use cases where, uh, where the graph database performance is thousands of times faster uh, than the relational database, as you might imagine. So in the previous slide here, we talked about 
uh, the connectedness of the data set along the x-axis and the response time on the y-axis. Now if we instead of response time just take a look at performance, we can draw this line which we'll call uh, the SQL database uh, zone of adequacy which is inside that line. And in there you have things like salary lists or ERP applications or, or CRM applications which many think of as, as quite relational. Outside that line, you have a lot of interesting applications that, that people deal with today. So most applications are not ERP and CRM, today at least. There are more applications that are, are more similar to network management and master data management. Um, lots of applications today include some kind of social aspect, be it an enterprise social or, or, or web social. Um, and, and this is really the graph database. Uh, optimal comfort zone, right? Um, this is where we operate with the majority of our customers. A key point here is that Neo is really built ground up for graphs, right? So all the way from the storage layers, and there are no tables at all, even the storage layers built for graphs, all the way up to the query language cipher, it's all built for graphs. You look at other NoSQL databases, they actually don't handle this at all. They don't handle connections between pieces of data at all. So if you want to query any kind of connected data in, in Mongo or React or Redis, you have to do it all manually, and people basically don't do it. The alternative is relational databases, which can represent relationships between things, but they do it poorly. And the reason is that, first of all, you need a rigid schema, which is, in, in many cases, it's costly to change. And also, if you know that a person has an account, if you know that about your domain, then you still, every time you want to ask, give me the accounts for this person, every time you do that, you need to join up these tables along these synthetic IDs. So every time you ask this question, you know that John has a certain account, you still need to do this join, which concept, right? But can you hear me still? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I was just saying, this is, this is really a legacy concept that dates back to the 70s, 80s, right? Where you, you, you got some salary list data and you needed to join it with some department information and people just needed to mangle that data. That's great. You can do that in a relational database. That's exactly what it's for. In modern development, people think about domains, right? You think about what are your domain objects? I have people, I have accounts, people have accounts, and so on. You think in these terms, and using a database that's, that's suited for ad hoc kind of computation and joining of, of some kind of synthetic ID is simply not suitable and not modern. Um, it, it's not, it was not originally built for that and has really been retrofitted for that purpose. Graphs are a much more natural fit to modern development where you actually know, okay, this is actually a person. Storing data about a person, this is an account, and they're actually related. I know that they're related. My application cares about that. That's something that graphs take care of. So to sum up, some of the top reasons that people use graph databases, number one is probably performance when you have lots of joins. You just want to improve your performance by orders of magnitude. You want to make your application real time. Another one is that you have a, a, a data set that evolves a lot, right? You don't know exactly what properties you'll have on your nodes. It could change tomorrow. You might tie in new information. Today you're only storing information about people and accounts. Tomorrow you're going to store information about insurance plans and so on. And uh, in order to be able to evolve your application, confidently without, without basically risking running into a wall development-wise, it, it's, it's a good choice to go with the graph database and, and a lot of our customers recognize that. The third one is that the shape of the domain is naturally graph and this is something that's, that's been uh, on, the, on the uprise, so to speak. Um, people coming to us and essentially saying, I have a graph that I need to store, right? And, and it's great to see people really starting to realize that, hey, this is a graph. This is, this is not a, 
a list of, of entries or something like that. It's a graph of, of my data. These things are related, and I care about that. I want to ask questions about it. Number four is actually really important as well, and it's something that people usually don't realize up front. But uh, as requirements change, um, and they very often do, if you've been in any kind of software project, you know that requirements change often. And uh, the, that's a really good thing, right? The, the business side needs to be able to change requirements based on what's happening in the world. And the tech side needs to be able to adapt to that, right? And uh, the tech side can do that really well with something like Near4j, where you, with, with the, 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 the flexible schema, you can um, add on any kind of information to the graph. You can ask questions about the data uh, that you previously were not able to. Um, and we've received that feedback from many customers, including, for example, Adobe, um, that they, when they received feedback and uh, new requirements from their business, they, they did not have any issues with adapting and, and incorporating those new requirements into their application, which is very interesting, I think. So let's just do a time check where we're at. I think we have about 15 minutes left, so let's take a look at a couple of more graphs in the real world uh, that we work with um, on a daily basis. We work with Accenture on uh, one of the largest uh, logistics projects in Europe, together with one of the largest logistics companies in Europe. And uh, they basically use Near4j for real-time routing of parcels in their parcel network, right? And they do about 5 million parcels per day. Uh, it all runs real-time on Near4j. As you might imagine, this is a 24-7 business critical operation and uh, really as, as, uh, as a package is, is going down the chute in the processing facility, the barcode gets scanned, the computation runs in Near4j where it's going to go and it gets diverted in, in, in the millisecond basically it gets diverted onto the right conveyor belt, onto the right truck and so on. And this company has um, a, a, a team of 50 administrators that, whose daily job is to maintain the root network that they deal with. And then uh, this gets directly updated in their Near4j cluster. And then this information gets rolled out into a much bigger Near4j cluster that is their, their operational data set that the real-time queries run against. Um, and and it's, uh, it's a very interesting project. And it, it's, it's very mission critical and runs, um, runs um, processes uh, lots of parcels. So uh, at peak, uh, which is, as, as you might imagine, in Europe at least, uh, it's around Christmas. I believe they process around 3,000 parcels per second. Um, and so people, people send a lot of mail um, around Christmas. Glassdoor is another one that I mentioned up front. It's uh, one of the biggest job search providers in the U.S. at least. And they, they're known for their salary search feature. I think everyone in the IT industry in the U.S. has tried it, at least. Um, and they had an interesting challenge where uh, if you sign in with Facebook on their site, they will pull in the Facebook graph uh, for you, and they'll find all your friends, and they'll find your friends' uh, employment uh, history, all this data. They'll pull in and store it in their own year for J graph. So they're running a cluster, uh, and uh, currently, I believe they're storing about 60% of the Facebook graph in their Neo cluster. And, and just that is a, it's quite a remarkable figure, serving real-time queries on that, real-time recommendations for, hey, you know this person who knows this person who works at this company. Maybe you should connect if you're interested in that company. And their, their cluster has also grown seamlessly. Uh, which is, is really interesting. They started out with a very small data set and, and now are over half of the Facebook graph. Um, they have that in the, in the cluster today. So that's, um, that's been quite an interesting journey for them. Um, just, just being able to make that move, staying on the same database, uh, not modifying uh, their queries really, right? So it's, um, it, it, it's quite powerful. It's quite a powerful story. Um, and just think about that yourself, scaling from from nothing to huge on the same technology. 
53 is an, also an interesting company. They were voted last year, or yes, last year, uh, they were voted best iPad app of the year by Apple. Um, if you haven't tried it, they have an app called Paper um, where you can basically draw things on your iPad, and it, it's a very good app. They're launching a new version of the product that adds on social uh, to the app, so you can collaborate with your friends and so on, and, and this obviously needs to be highly robust, and it needs to be able to represent uh, all the data they need to power this social feature, which may include who are your friends, what are your sketches, what parts of your sketches do you want to share, and so on, right? And being a small company, being an agile business, they want to be able to adapt this quickly. So if a new requirement comes up, if a new user need comes up, they want to be able to add that feature in very quickly. And uh, they've had great success with Neo, and they also have a presentation that you can check out by their lead architect um, on lessons learned with Neo. It's called Betting the Company on a Graph Database. CuraSpan in the U.S. is uh, one of the leaders in patient management. They manage thousands of, of, uh, of uh, healthcare facilities. Um, they had a challenge where they wanted to ask graph search like queries, right? So in this particular example, um, a, uh, a practitioner can ask, find a skilled nursing facility within so-and-so miles of a given location belonging to healthcare group so-and-so that offers speech therapy and cardiac care and optionally also Italian language services. And that, as you might imagine from the, the previous query we looked at, the Facebook query, that's also a, a graph pattern, a graph search query that you can look for. And uh, as, as many of our other customers, they tried Oracle. So uh, as we talked about before, right, there are different databases that represent this connected concept, graph databases and, and relational databases primarily. And in, in the majority of the cases where our customers and prospects have evaluated a relational database, the performance has not been anywhere near um, the graph database, and the cost has often been, have been orders of magnitude higher. So in, in this particular case, uh, it, it worked out quite well for them, and they have real-time performance for, for all their queries, right, that may span across all kinds of different data, right? It might span across <clears throat> healthcare groups. It might span across um, specialties um, and, and language services, as we talked about as well. And uh, they, they have replaced um, lots of SQL with um, with not very much Cypher. We have another customer, uh, a Nordic telco called Telenor. I don't have a slide on them, I think, but they replaced I think 1,500 lines of SQL stored procedure with uh, 10 lines of Cypher. So there are just some factors there. When you, can, you can imagine replacing 1,500 lines with 10 lines and really just bringing down the complexity of the solution while also moving that to being real time. We work a lot with Cisco as well. Uh, one of the Cisco projects that we work with them on is Cisco.com. So that's the, the support site. And they realized that um, they have a lot of data locked in their systems, data on cases, data on solutions, data on communications between support reps and uh, customers, right? And all this data references each other in different ways. So what they figured out was if they could unlock that data and leverage it, they can probably reduce their call center volume. So in this particular case, you might be looking at the knowledge base article at the bottom here. And they know that the knowledge base article is referenced by a certain support case that has a solution. And the solution references another knowledge base article. So maybe you're interested in looking at that article. And by, by recommending these, these uh, relevant related articles, they can lower their call center volume and thereby save a lot of money, which is, which is good. We also work with a large investment bank in London. Uh, so we have uh, a, a number of customers within finance. And this is one of them. And, and their challenge was that when new investment managers were brought on board, they had to be given access to uh, a, a wide set 
of resources and assets for, for, for trading and insight and so on. And this process would, would typically be calculated, it would typically lose the trader five days of work uh, because they had to wait for all these manual permissions to be granted before they could get started doing their actual job. And uh, if you're a very large organization, this can actually be quantified into quite a number of dollars. And competitors have already implemented um, alternatives for this slow process. So what they did was they turned to NEO and they can now do it um, very quickly, um, basically mapping out uh, the permissions for who can access what kind of resource. And obviously it's not just directly one. You may be in a group that has access to things and so on. Viadeo is uh, the second largest professional social network in the world after LinkedIn. Um, they're, they're big in, in uh, Asia, I believe, as well. And uh, they had a challenge where uh, they wanted to be able to show how are you related to someone else or how, how do you know someone else through your network and through their network. So they had a feature, uh, or they still have a feature, that basically given some other person in the social network, it shows you how do you get an introduction to that person. It could be, uh, they believe, I believe it was up to four hops at that time they could show. And this was computed on a MySQL cluster. Um, it was done in batch, right? <clears throat> and the batch computation would take a week to run. And uh, so basically they would run it. It would take a week to compute the data to answer the query. And they, they, when, it, when the batch computation was done, they started it off again, ran another week, and they got some new data again. So any, any questions that you asked of that data were basically a, a, up to a week old. Um, and what they did was they did a pilot with NEO. Um, we did a POC with them in one day. And, and eight weeks later, they put it into production with NEO. And the entire query runs in real time in milliseconds now. And they're still using it heavily. Um, so it was a great success for them. And they, they very much enjoyed that experience. So we're at the end now. And I would just like to pose a challenge to all of you to think about what are the graphs in your industry and how can you leverage them given what you've seen today. So thank you very much for coming today. I hope you learned a little bit about graphs, graph technology, uh, what it is and where it's being used. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer them as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for giving us uh, some insights into uh, what the graph database is and, uh, you know, what we can, uh, on numerous use cases that you talked about. I think it will uh, stir up some thoughts in the community which is uh, mostly uh, not exposed to gra graphs so far. So what I would try to do now is uh, unmute all and uh, leave the floor for questions. David, can you unmute, unmute because I don't seem to be able to do that. Hmm. Okay, now I'm unmuted. We could either we could unmute all, or we could use the other questions. Yeah. yeah hold on, just a yeah, second. Hold on, just a second. I'm trying to unmute. Unmute. Okay, so uh, sorry, I went ahead and muted all because I yeah, ac actually, uh, do you have un questions? Do you unmute. Have questions? Maybe you could type them in the questions module. Yeah, can you type in the questions?
David, it appears, you know, I'm not able to unmute. I can hear you. Yeah, I, I, because I am uh, an organizer, you can hear me. But just for the guys, let us do one thing. Uh, we will have the questions uh, sent to me. Okay, I will uh, give you my... Uh, Otherwise, you can drop a line to David directly. Would you be able to answer, uh, David, if that is done? Yeah, ha happy to. Let, let's do that. So, if you wanna, uh, if you want to send um, send me your questions, you can uh, tweet me uh, at dmontag, and you can also use the hashtag near for j if you want. Um, so, ha happy if you tweet. We're very responsive on Twitter. So, any questions at all, just there. Or if you wanna send it to me privately, you can certainly do that as well. David at NearTechnology.com. If you want to download our product, you can go to Near4J.org to do that. Um, sure. And just uh, get, get started there. Great, David. Uh, with that, uh, I think I will reach out to the group who attended uh, uh, this webinar separately with my uh, contact details as well, and uh, we can take the discussion forward. Great, guys. Perfect. Thank you for attending. Uh, thank you, uh, David. I will uh, get in touch with you offline. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone.